Hello and good afternoon and welcome back to Unlocking the Power of You and I'm Timothy White Sr. And we have another great, fantastic program today. We have a number of people in the studio with us today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and after that we're going to jump in and talk more about bullying. Starting with our female guest. Hi, my name is Marva White and I'm very excited to be here. I am the CEO of the Children's Writing Clinic, which is a nonprofit that is designed to assist young people to improve their reading and writing skills. I'm glad to be here. All right. And my name is Art Finley. I'm sales and marketing director of Tim White Publishing Company. My name is Wilson Jones. I am an instructor for Building Futures, and I am an executive at the Build my future outcast. Okay, so that's an introduction, and everyone has said some great things about themselves presently. So we know who you are now, and this program is going to be talking about who you were and where you come from. And I want the audience to know right now, those of you who are watching and listening, that all three of these people sitting at the table with me were bullies. And they're going to tell you something about that bullying. I know, I know, especially you, right? I don't want to talk about it, but everybody knows you were a bully. But we want to talk about these, the women, because we hear a lot about women not being bullies. We don't hear about women being bullies. Why is that? Why do you think we don't hear anything about women being bullies? Oh, I can't answer that. Um, I hear a lot about um, women being bullies or chill, girls who are bullies, definitely, or mean girls, uh, sometimes what we call them in the school building. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that um, there are a lot of different reasons why people become bullies, and I certainly can't speak to everyone, but I can totally speak as to how or why I was a bully. And I think that you had a young man on your show the week before last whose story very much mimicked mine. And uh, I became a bully when I realized I couldn't read. When I could not read, you know, I would stumble on words in the classroom and the kids would laugh. I would get angry. I learned at an early age that anger, or I mean laughter at me, was not something that I enjoyed. And, and I retaliated by working these hands. Okay, now you say you retaliated. By working the hands, That's right. you became a bully because you were teased, talked about, or laughed, laughed at, at, laughed I at. Couldn't read. Okay, when you say couldn't read, what do you mean couldn't read? But there's a. Oh, I just could not read at all. I was a slow learner, and I didn't understand why I was a learner. Um, back in my day, when I was in school, the teachers actually had the opportunity to be teachers. They didn't have to wear all the different hats that the educators have to wear now. If I were a child in today's time, no doubt that my uh, learning disability would have been recognized at a very early age. But um, I, I'm dyslexic and I have dyscalculia, which basically means you have very difficult reading and you can't add up anything. So... <laughs> Stay away from numbers as much as possible. But I wasn't. And it wasn't until I was um, about to graduate from college um, when I actually got diagnosed with my disability. So trying to deal with it and not knowing what it was I was dealing with while growing up was was challenging. But um, you learn to compensate um, for a lot of things um, or a lot of you know, deficiencies that you may have or that people may have. But in the process, though, when I was younger and I didn't know what, what the problem was and I didn't understand why I couldn't learn to read as rapidly as the other kids, and when they would laugh, I would just say, I'm going to kick your butt after school. You know, you, you make a fantastic point that we need to really elaborate on, that dyslexia. There's a lot of children, young people out here, similar to you, who have it don't know what to do or how to do it, and don't know who to go to. Now, before we talk about that a little bit, I want to ask you this, because this is something that's important, too. You're an educator yourself now. Yeah. And as an educator, how did that affect you becoming an educator? Oh, tremendously. Um, first of all, um, 
as being a bully, it's it has uh, affected me uh, with the, in the way in which I handle or deal with anyone. I'm extremely empathetic, which I never was as a younger person, but I'm empathetic except for with that person at the end of the table. I'm empathetic with everyone. And I try to take things under consideration, like, you know, put myself in their shoes to try to see, you know, the story from their angle as opposed to just mine. So that comes so easily for me. As an educator, it is almost a honing little beaking that comes on when I come across a young person who has difficulties reading or, or writing or uh, oftentimes um, letters are switched or transposed and things of that nature. Or sometimes you can have a student who actually does everything completely backwards. It's just like a red flag for me and I can just pull them aside and, and then talk with the powers that be in the school system or that building to help the young person get more health assistance. So with that being said, too, there are many teachers or educators become bullies because they don't understand some of the things that these young people may be experiencing while they're in the classes. I agree 110 percent. As a matter of fact, I just did a final. I just had to do a research paper on uh, whether or not educators should accept by dialectalism in the classroom. Well, our people of color, I usually (laughs) have two different dialects we and we put it on I call it it's code switching I can put it on when I'm sitting here with you guys and I can speak as properly as I need to but when it's just me and my best friend all that comes the other bully the other bully okay we'll get to him shortly we're going well I don't speak when I'm speaking one-on-one with my friends it's not the same way that I speak when I'm at work or, or when I'm on a podcast, you know, I can speak the King's English extremely well, but I can speak Ebonics or African American English or whatever, ever term you'd like to use it when I'm comfortable at home and my friends in a classroom. <clears throat> if the educator is not, um, doesn't know your dialect, oftentimes they will can shun you or say that the, um, the language that you speak or your dialect is, is not important, is, is, is unacceptable, it's wrong, and which is the worst thing to tell a kid. The way you speak at home is just wrong. No, there's another way to say a lot of the things. But a lot of times educators who don't understand what's happening, they can lash out. Now let me ask cool. this too, uh, and we're going to bring the other guests in, but I'll ask you this because it's important. What you've just displayed or talked about, is it the same in the educational field for black students and white students? So uh, we're not talking about educators now. We're talking about the children. Well, how they how they approach the young person who may have dyslexia or some other Mm -hmm. issue within the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, Is is it approached differently? Because you might have a a young black child in in the classroom going through some issues. And you have a white teacher don't know what they're going through. Correct. So they may be hard on that student because they don't understand the background of that particular student. So what I think I'm asking you then is how should they approach it then, uh, a white educator and a black educa- educator in the same way? Or is a, a specific way that they need to address that issue? Every educator needs to learn their demographics. So let me break that down. If I'm coming to work or teach and I know that the uh, community is a Hispanic community, then I need to go check out the community and learn what's happening in that community. That way, when I am attempting to teach something that can be very small and very easy, uh, trivial even, but is a necessary, like a fundamental building block, in order to make sure that that young person can understand where I'm coming from, I need to meet them where they are so that I can bring them where I need them to be. So here's an example. Let's say it's treat time and I have my Hispanic class and I'm going to pass out treats and I bring in hot fries. They probably won't touch them, don't want them, don't know what they are. That's not their demographics. But I can go into their community and bring some Takis, which is just like hot fries, but it's their Hispanic snack. And they're like, oh, wow, 
she's she's hip. She knows me. She's learning me. She's taking the time to invest in me. And that's a difference that a lot of educators simply do not they're not vested, mm-hmm. nor do they invest in their um, student population. So uh, in Cleveland, I hope I'm not talking too much or saying it's too much. You, but you're on a Cle- podcast. Share. <laughs> Cleveland pays some good money for mm-hmm. their educators. East Cleveland pays more. To have, not saying all of them, but some white people will come clear across drive a long way to get to East Cleveland so they can get that dollar. Every person that doesn't, that's uncolored, that comes clear across the way to get that dollar is not vested in the demographics or the young people who are in that community. I see you shaking your head, Art, so jump right in there then because I saw your eyebrows raised when she was talking about coming in and how people do it. So as far as the bullying and the demographics, how do you feel that plays a, a role? Well, it has a lot to play because we've had an opportunity to set a, uh, sit down and talk to a high school here that is involved with the Cleveland public school system. And the teachers were appalled that we thought that they had a problem. We knew that they had a problem. And just like Marva touched on, they're coming from another side of town and they're at a school, and we use John Hay, that is academically up there. So you don't see the same things that you see in Cleveland schools, East Cleveland schools, Maple Heights, Garfield Heights. You just don't see the same things, and what they see are all the good things. Mm-hmm. They see the kids in school. And so, but those Pretty good kids grades. To, yeah, those kids have to go home. Got to go 79th home. and Superior. Mm-hmm. So that whole game changes once they leave the confinement of that school and the safety. Mm-hmm. And I get off that bus on Absolutely. 79th and Superior. Mm-hmm. What's up, Marv? Correct. And or I'm coming home. You don't know what, because you're not vested. You don't know what's happening in my home life. You don't know who's, who am I coming home to. Um, I remember I had a student. He was only in the second grade. And I won't say the school, but it definitely was a Cleveland school. And this second grader would come to school tardy every single day, even though I know he literally lived around the corner from the school. Um, He had a bad rap. None of the teachers wanted him in his class. So who ends up with him in his class? Me. So one day I decided just to talk to him because he came in the class and I was like, you're tardy again? What's going on? You know what? Blank you, blank you, blank you too. I ain't got to tell you nothing. Blah, blah, blah. Now he's all, you know, all going through all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I push him, get him out the room, sit down, finally let him talk. I mean, actually listen to what the kid is saying just to find out that the second grader is tired. He got to school late because he was up looking for his mama. His mama using drugs. So she, his job was not necessarily to allow the mom to take care of him, but he had to take care of his mom. Not only did he take care of his mom, he actually went out and purchased whatever she needed, whatever drugs she needed to keep her in the house so that when he came home from school, he would know where his mama was, second grade. Now, these are some of the things that, that no, no second grader should have to well, be we, thinking in that manner. Well, we know that no child should have to be no, put in that kind of position to, to become a parent. this was his situation. But no one in the school would take the time to actually talk to the young person and learn why are you acting out, why are you behaving. The kid is hungry. The kid is sleepy. Mm-hmm. He's tired. <laughs> and he's not even being able to be a kid. So like you said, you got the kids that leave the good school, they go home, they don't know when their next meal is coming. A lot of of our kids only get their meal when they are in the school building. Um, And and Fridays, uh, if anyone took a poll, I would go out on a limb and say that the majority of the kids who were our so-called problem kids cut up big time on Friday because they don't know when what they're going to eat on Saturday. (laughs) Sunday, and they can't wait to get to school on Monday. They're coming to school on Monday so they can eat. 
And that could give two hills of beans of whatever it is we're trying to teach. Now, we're going to go all the way to the end of the table. Brother Jones. Yes, sir. And you were a bully at one time. And what Marva, you're saying is accurate 1,000%. But there are bullies who intervene or get in between that child being vested or invested in. And someone wants to control that child. And you were a bully at one time, correct? Now, I want to say that because we want to back up a little bit, too. You were a bully, but you are now what? Well, you can consider me as an educator because I teach Build and Future. I teach returned citizens how to become citizens once again by giving them a trade. Now, what made me become a bully? Because I was bullied. So in order to, I guess, to exhaust the anger that I had within me, I had to find someone that I could pick on that I could beat because we had a couple bullies in our neighborhood. And they would take your lunch money or, you know, and then I was the only one who grew up in my home. I, I didn't grow up with my brothers and sisters, so I had to defend myself. But then that, the anger just pushed you to pick on someone that was, you know, less powerful than you were. We just consider that. So they were helpless, pretty much. Yeah, pretty happened. much. I didn't want to use that word. That's, but that, that's, that's, that's the that's truth. The right. truth well, is they, they were helpless. Right. Right. So you had that lion uh, mentality going out on the Serengeti, and you you pick out your prey. You you Which find a person that, hey, that's the weakest one. I, I'm going to get that one, and I'm going to take advantage of it. But you said something that's really important for us to uh, dwell on a little bit, and that's you were angry. Yes. So what caused you to be angry as a child? Well, what caused me to be angry for number one, I believe my household was the only one that had a single child, and everybody else, they had siblings that they could actually play with. And Don't get me wrong, I was spoiled, I had everything it was, but when you don't have siblings to actually play with or blame something on, you become angry. I like what you're saying. It's kind of funny when you think about it. I needed somebody to blame something on. Correct. If something I mean, went wrong in the home, I need somebody to, to say it's I'm, your fault, huh? Right, right. I, you know, it was done by me. Simple, okay. you know, simple man. So you went out and decided to find somebody to blame things well, on. Then. Well, you know, not as much. I went out to actually find someone to blame things on. When someone at school would blame something on me, and then I was a person that people could talk me into doing stuff, and I would go out and do it. I mean, I would just, you know. So you were easy. Not, not easy. <laughs> I was a, what do they call it? I was a agitator. Gullible? Yeah. No, <laughs> well, gullible is a little bit. But okay. You dare me to do it, I'd do it. And that's because I wanted to create friends. I wanted to have someone in my corner. And like I stated, we had a couple of bullies on the street. And they, they, were, they were real mean bullies as, you know, I, I take your stuff from you. And I feel that was unfair. So, you know, like I said, it built up a pot of anger. And you found someone that was less angered and angry than you were and that you could get away with stuff, you would take advantage of them. And it was male and females that we were bullying. And we, we're going to talk about the male and female again, too, because we had this woman who was a bully here. And, and she's still a bully. And, I mean, we're okay. just going to get some clarity here. She bullies me. That's why I'm not saying it. Well, we're going to talk about that, too, a little bit <laughs> coming up, because the women bully different than guys yes, do at times. Yes, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a woman don't always have to put her hands on you to bully you. Well, it, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And we, we're going to talk about that, but I want to go back to something you just said a moment ago, too. You you found the bullies became an example to you then. Which is true, which is true. I mean, it's like if you're in that circle, you become that circle to survive. Because I feel as uh, if you stay soft, people that were not bullies would bully you. So that you had to become a bully. You had to build up a rep. And then you sometimes you get enough energy to go after that bully that bullied you and check him. And then he becomes your friend, and you become the bully of him. So what you're saying is it became a cycle. Which is true. And so with that being said, how do we, especially for the viewers and the listeners out there, how do we stop the cycle then? Because we know it exists. That's a problem. It's a legitimate problem. So what are some of the solutions that, based on what you're saying, and this is to all of us here on uh, the panel here and talking, about, what are some of the solutions to deal with that then, because there's some young people out there saying, you know what, I can identify with you, but what do I do? Because you told me this is happening, and I have people who are doing this to me, but what can I do to offset that? Basically, like Ms. White stated, we need to find out what's the problem, what's causing you to be angry, what's driving you to go out and bully someone, is it problems at home, is there something that's, that's that 
it's not settling in your mind that needs to settle. If we find out where a person's going and how they're going to get there, do they need help? And see, first thing we what we fail to do is sit down and says, "What can I help you do? How can I help you get to the next level of life? What what caused you to become like you are today?" We never listen. We always barking off, "Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this." And our parents are good for that. How often do your parents sit down and listen to you? Says, "Mom, this is what happened at school today." I believe the teacher was unfair to me. You know, can we sit down and talk about it? You know you open up a can of worms there because you're talking about parents, parents doing Which is or true. parents not doing. So we can have a number of young people coming from the house or coming from home, being bullied, go to the school, being bullied, come back home, being bullied. Correct. And, and we, we don't listen to them. We're not listening to them saying, hey, I'm hurting. Can you help me? So, and I, Marva said earlier too, uh, you know, what some of those signals, you mentioned the signals. So what are some of the signals that they're giving to us that we're not paying attention to then as parents when they're being bullied? What are we, what are we missing? As parents, well, I, I use my son as a prime example. I was basically building my career and what he was missing was a father, someone to sit down and discuss things with, uh, to throw the ball back and forth with him. I thought it was to buy him things. You know, this is why I'm accelerating in my career so he can have the nicest tennis shoes and latest clothes, the newest bikes and things of that nature. And that's what he did not need. He needed a father, someone to say, Dad, uh, how do I do this? Uh, how does a, a man uh, raise his family and things of that nature? And that's one thing we fail to do is so into our children, especially our men, to teach them how to be men. Because it takes a man to teach a man how to be a man. So bullies are people who hurt and are hurting, hurting. And, and they tend to want to hurt people from what you Absolutely. said about yourself. You're anger. hurting, you're hurting, you're angry. So you take that on somebody. Hurt people. Hurt, hurt people. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we need to find the solution. But I think part of that solution is what everybody is saying too. listen. Correct. Are we listening to them when they're communicating? Most people li- they hear, but they're not listening. Absolutely, mm-hmm. they're that only process. waiting for you. They're only waiting for you to shut up so they can make their point. Correct, mm-hmm. and that's not what we should be doing. We should be having our ears open to and attentive to them when they're saying, "Hey, I'm hurting." And how do they let us know that they're hurting? Oftentimes, you like to yeah. want to say something. Go yeah, on. I was just going to piggyback off of what you were saying. A lot of times, they're not going to tell us that they're hurting, but they'll have some non-communicative mm-hmm. um, actions that. Um, we have to pay attention to. Um, speaking as an educator, if I see I've got one kid who is always by himself, that's a that's a red flag mm-hmm. for me. He's he's not in a part of a group. He doesn't have a friend. He's not communicating or playing with anyone or eating it with anyone. He's by himself. So isolation is one. Not eating when, especially when I already know the type of maybe household that he's coming from where he really should be eating, but he has no appetite or it could be the exact opposite. He's eating everything, Mm -hmm. eating everything um, to compensate or to, you know, sometimes food can become your friend and uh, we'll latch on to that. Even young people, young kids will latch on to that. And there are many more that I can't think of at the top of my head. Well, that's, That's something we need, we need to address as well because you may mention that food becomes your friend mm-hmm. and becomes your ally. You want mm-hmm. to do that. You're trusting that. Because when we're hurting, and you mentioned this too a moment ago, hurt people hurt people. And we know when we're hurting what we should do as adults. Yeah. We know what we should do. But what about the children? The children don't know what to do. Right. Well, I know that I saw something that I want to share with you guys. And I saw it and I said, oh, that is so cool. If every parent did something similar to this, how cool would this be? So the mom held up this piece of paper to her two little girls. And she says to the little girls, say something mean to the paper. And so one little girl says, you are so ugly. So the mom crunched up a little bit. Then she says to another girl, go ahead, say something. She says, and you stink too. And they continue to hurl, you know, insults insults to Mm -hmm. the paper. You don't have any friends. 
and you ugly and you smell funny and you real dumb. So the mom balls up the piece of paper. Then she says, say I'm sorry to this paper. And so the girls say, I'm sorry, I apologize. So then the mom does this. Is this paper okay? And the little girl says, no, it's all wrinkled and ugly. I don't want that paper. And she says, and this is why we don't bully. It still hurts. The paper is hurt. Even though you apologized, okay, that's great, but look at the paper. No one's going to want to use this piece of paper. Now, if it's a small visual, and, and it's a small little, I don't know, TikTok. I got it. I saw it on TikTok. But if every parent approached bullying or teaching bullying in that manner, there's a visual for the young kids. I mean, this one girl, she might one was four, and the other one looked like she was about nine. You think they understood bullying? I think they got it. So if we could just take the time to do things like this with our young people, our children, our grandkids, you know, whomever we find ourselves around, we can help at least one other kid to have a better understanding of what bullying is and hopefully avoid it. It was directing that anger, we should say. And I agree with her on that point because that's why I love to play golf. When I started playing golf, I could sit on that driving range and I could hit that ball just as hard as I could. It, it exhaust the anger that was built within me. So you, you can redirect that anger. But see, now there's some people out here who may not know two things, how to redirect that anger and how to understand what that anger is. Correct. Or what causes that anger. And many of us don't know the cause of it. We just know we are angry. We have been blessed here, some of us, because what you said earlier is, hey, I didn't have a sibling to blame something on. So you knew where your anger was coming from. Correct. The young man who was in school, who was acting out, didn't know, don't know. Only thing they know, hey, I want my mom to be at home. So I'm going to do anything that I can to keep her at home. He was reach, lashing out, but reaching out at the same time. And what we don't do as a coordinated effort is talk to our children rather than talk at our children. And that's what we lack, the, the fortitude, if you will, to do what is right. And uh, they asked Martin Luther King, when, when should we do right? He said the right time to do right is always right. So we shouldn't look for reasons to do right. Just do right. And uh, the young people are, are hungering for leadership and education. As, as you were saying about your, you, as you call it, your, your problem is dyslexic, uh, being dyslexic. And when we were kids, and I know Art and Otis, you guys, maybe you guys remember back in the 70s, we we're coming up, they didn't call, they called kids retarded. They had the Cuyahoga Board of Mental Retardation. Absolutely. And when we were in school, they had down in the basement where the retards were. Mm -hmm. Called a fly shop. All of those things, but they were derogatory things, that, but we made them acceptable. Mm -hmm. Should they ever been acceptable? And why do we still accept it? That's open. That's open to everybody, that's please. A, you know, that's, that's, that's a good question that you've thrown out there. We did speaking engagement at Shaker... Uh, school system and they talked something about imports and I for a long time I couldn't figure out what they were talking about and what they were talking about people that was not actually starting in K at Shaker school system and that they were hurting the school system because of their learning abilities because one thing about Shaker, Shaker go where you are to teach you, they don't actually put you in a fly shop or uh, call you what they call DH, what they call children now today DDH, DDH or, DD or something of that nature. Yeah. But or they AD. find where you are. And they Somebody can. explain that so some listeners and viewers may not know what that DDH or DH is, is. So what is it? So they will know as Disordered well. Disordered child. What, I'm, uh, or dis, um, disability, basically. Um, a or, child with disabilities? Mm -hmm, or, um, and oh, it was DDR. And it, the DDR. R did stand for retardation. And I think they've changed those letters now. I think right, they, they, use, they, they don't letter. use retard or retardation anymore but the special needs or a special education. And then um, while my learning disability is dyslexia, back in the day, there were only a handful of disabilities. Now there's, there's a plethora of disabilities where 
um, they actually come into play in the school, in the classroom. And it's the, the educator's uh, responsibility to try to catch whatever flag that may pop up so that they can um, assess or reassess the young person so that their person is getting the special help that that person needs. So now I'll ask this question. Did they change that retardation because it was wrong or was politically incorrect? Politically incorrect. P- politically sure. incorrect. Because that means they can still do it, but their poli- uh, politically correctness, political correctness says don't call them retarded. No. Call them special needs. Let's call them special needs. Now rename it, but there's still the same po- problem existing. And we're not going to fix it. Why not? Uh, and that's the thing. They, because of the finance. You know, the finance they get for a child is uh, mentally challenged. That's what they are today. Mentally challenged. It's, it's all about dollars and cents. And I'll say, this is why I say that, because when I came through the school system, Cleveland had the number one school system. We had aviation, we had carpentry, we had auto mechanics. We had a lot of things of that nature. Now it's college or penitentiary, because penitentiary is a big dollar market today. So everything is still, and the topic of this show, this program is still about bullying. So that's a bully's mentality, because a bully wants control. Which is true. Bully wants power, ultimate power. So you're going to do exactly what I say, the way I say it, because I'm paying for this. Absolutely. So what role do we really have then? Really, we, we have a very small role because we use the government. The government is a big bully because if they say we want you to wear pink socks, they'll come up with some kind of system and say, well, you need to wear pink socks. Just like these masks. I'm not, I'm not going to even go on to that. You have the power every four years. Yeah. Vote. Use your power. But then does it work? You know what? I found that the only thing works is the thing that we work. True. So we can say they're not doing this and they're not doing that, but either we are causes or solutions. Which is true. And many of us don't want to take the position of part, being a part of the solution because that's going back to something you said too earlier, Marva. We have to invest. Right. And then we, we're, we're scared of the bullet. The who? The who? The bullet. The being the, the bullet? bullseye. Because okay. you look at Martin Luther King. He was an organizer. He knew how to bring people to a point where we're going to make this work. And when you make things work and it hurts the financial pocket of the big shots, they're going to eliminate you. So that's why we don't have the leaders that we have today. So we've really accepted the bully mentality. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know what? I'm not going to say anything because I don't want a bullseye on my back. Correct. But. It's never going to change until someone steps up to the plate. I, I use a prime example. There was a young lady. I used to have a problem with female preachers, right? There was a young lady that stood up in the pulpit. She says, when a man step up and do what she have to do, I'll step down. From that point on, I have respect. And we don't step up to the plate and do what we're supposed to do. Simple math. Well, yeah, and I have to agree because you mentioned that earlier. Men have to learn how to be men. Absolutely. And we had a discussion about that yesterday at the barbershop. Men aren't stepping up. And men are making you. men are t- making excuses for not stepping up. Then they get angry with the women who do step up. True, and, and say we well, know why 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 is she doing that? Well, because you're not doing it. That's why our young men have problems. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that we could fix, but we just need to step up to the plate and do it. Absolutely, absolutely. So bullying, as bad as bullying is, is something that can be reconciled. We can do something about it. Here's something funny: a baby's a bully. Because he screams and hollers to you, changes and give him milk. Well, that, that baby is doing what a baby do. But <laughs> that baby is only uh, crying for a requirement. Yes. Bully is not a requirement. Because well, none mean, of us are born to be bullies. We choose to be bullies because of what we said at the onset. We're hurting. We're, we need somebody to blame somebody. on, Or we need to just beat up on somebody because they're doing something we don't like. Now, I wanted to come back to this matter I was saying earlier about women, how they were bullied. They don't always... Some of the biggest bullies can be women because women don't have to lay a hand on you. That's true, because of the persuader. We, we know that we get beat up. You bully me, I bully you, we get in a confrontation. Or I mean, you and Art bully one another. I, I prefer that. You beat up one another. He has a black eye, you got a black bloody nose. You go home and fix your nose. He put a stake on his eye. She can talk about him like a dog. And she's beat him up just as bad as you did with the scar that will last forever. Because the physical one will heal, 
that emotion one stays for a lot longer. Wow, you know what? And that, that brings up a good point because if you look at a man that has been in the world that's being beat up on the job and wherever he's actually out and he comes home and gets beat up from his wife, instead of his, her comforting him saying, hey, baby, it's going to be all right. What do we need to get do to get to the next level? Mm. Oh, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you take the garbage out? Why is the car parked on my side of the garage? Things of that nature. Let me ask this question then. Miss Marvin is going to be kind of towards you a little bit. A little bit. I'm just saying a little bit because I know Art has really said a lot because he's, the, he's, a, a, quiet, bully. he's a quiet bully. Yes. But this is something that I, I've heard it before. I'm sure all of us have heard it before. And maybe you know, I want you to elaborate on it a little bit because I know you heard it as well. What you just said, how often do you hear coming up, that man's henpecked. He's henpecked. You've heard that before, a man being henpecked? I've heard that. Okay. Phrase. Did anybody know what that, what, I wrote it down, what henpecked, the definition of henpecked is. Definition so of I, want to, I want to hear from you first what you think henpecked is. Tell well, me. Henpecked is when the woman is always telling him what to do, and he's basically a yes, dear, no, dear kind of guy. Do that again. Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Martha. <laughs> no, Martha. All right, Henpeck. I know you heard the term before. There's a woman, uh, you say, always telling a man what to do. Yeah. A lot of that's on a man and how he's grown up and what he's seen from his father and within the home. Uh, my home was basically coming up with three people, my mother and father and myself. Mm -hmm. We knew who the leader of that house was, and we knew who the individuals there who would support, and then the ones who had to do. It fell on me as the last individual there. So uh, henpeck is a lot of things that, uh, uh, would you say if an individual was the only boy with four or five sisters that he's henpecked? He could learn to be henpecked. I like that because it doesn't mean he has to be. But he, as Marvin just said, he, he can learn to be because that's a learned behavior too. I want to come back yes, to that is. too. I want to hear <laughs> Brother well, Jones, henpeck. Henpeck. Henpeck is... A smart man, because by <laughs> being <laughs> happy wife, no, happy no, no, life. don't, don't say right. that because we're gonna come back to that too. Right. Henpeck's a smart man because if you want peace in at home, you'll be henpeck. Um, now let me give you the definition of henpeck, and then we're gonna come back to what you just said because that was the other segue was gonna come into that as well. <laughs> henpeck, a man who is continually dominated, intimidated, bullied. Or browbeaten by a woman, especially his wife or girlfriend. Henpeck. That's not a good thing. Well, well, it depends. That's not a good thing. It no, depends. we no, we can make it. You can say, well, you know what? I'm going to make it delicious, but it's still not a good thing to be henpecked. And I, I, we can talk biblically, but we're going to wait on that. Henpeck is just what Marvin was saying. Women know how to manipulate. And get things going. And the man becomes henpecked because some of the guys feel, oh, you know, I have to acquiesce to her because she's my woman and I, I want to have peace in the house and so forth. But is that necessarily the right thing to do or the best thing to do? Being henpecked. It, it depends on the platform. Because you have to sleep in the home. She cooks your food. She that means he's lazy. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, basically, I, understand what I you're guess. Saying. I came through the old school rank, mm -hmm. uh, ranks of life where man's supposed to make sure the finances there. You know, he buys a house, a woman makes it a home. Uh, he buys the food, I mean the groceries, woman makes food and things of that nature. So it's sometimes it's a good thing to be henpecked. Sometimes, with that being said, you limit a woman's ability to be herself too because you simply say, "Hey, I'm going to do all these things. You don't have to do it." And where she may say, I want a life too. I want a career. I want to go out and do certain things because you're saying, I shouldn't do it. I can't do it. I don't need to do it. Never said that. And I'm saying, but yeah. there are women who will feel that way because Correct. they simply say, I want the freedom to be able to decide for me what I want to do as well. Not just for you to decide for me what I need to do. And so, what if the things that you've, you've decided I'm supposed to do happen to not be the things that I want to do. The things that you've decided that you're going to do might be the things that I do best. That's something interesting because um, being a, a, a divorcee, my, my husband 
took on the role of I'm going to do these things and uh, you do these things. But a lot of the things that he did, he just didn't do well. <laughs> Whereas I might have done a better job in that particular task, but because he insisted upon doing it, things just fell. It was a, became a hot mess. So Not, you're saying that you were a better provider than he was? I didn't say that. But I, I'm saying that while, um, and even if I did bring in more money than he did, that's not the point. The point is, if, if are you handling, if you're taking the money and distributing it properly, or if you have a problem with distributing the funds properly, but I don't, I'm the one who needs to be distributing the funds. I if, if I if I can if I know I can handle paying the bills, and you might do better going grocery shopping. And cooking the food. To some, that might be a role reversal type of thing. To a smart household, those two people working as a team, there where I go. do That's well. The word I want to yes, do. where I do well, where I fall at, you do well at. Okay, so now we're working together. And where you fall at, I do well. We're latching together as one. But if 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 you just have in your head and your mindset that oh I have to do these things and you have to do those things, wow, you're limiting you're limiting both of us and neither of us will get a chance to learn to do what the other one does. If I drop dead, but the thing and that you've got me set with doing these things, now I'm dead. How are you going to continue? Because you don't know what the heck I'm doing over here because that's not your place. See, that's a bully mentality in the home. But go on, Archie. You're like, oh, you were anxious there. So go on and take it and do yes, what it you Yes, it is. She brought up one important answer right there. It's a team effort. And when the people, in, when the kids in the family see this here, mom and dad working, and they're successful, then they know what it takes to be a team effort. I had three daughters, and my thing was to be able to teach them the things that men do, supposedly. So you're able to do those things for yourself. It's not taking anything away from a man or anything, because if you're a man, you're coming to the table with that attitude. If you're less than that, then you have less than that attitude. And then people can direct you and use you however they want to. But the key thing that Marvin said that stands out and I play sports all my life. It's team. When the team wins, everybody wins. Mm -hmm. And everybody in that house sees that. Mm -hmm. It's a great example. It's a great visual. Leaders, leadership, and that's what you're really referring to. Leadership is not bossy. Leadership is not bullying. It's leadership. And leadership means I understand the dynamics of leadership. And the greatest part of leadership is humility. Yeah. When you don't have humility, you really don't have good leadership. You have someone, a, a boss and a bully in waiting because they are seeking an opportunity to let you know, this is what I want you to do. This is what we're going to do. And what you're saying, Art, is so true, that team effort. And if we're moving as a team, and Marva, you said it as well, you do this better than me. If I cook better than my wife, then I should be the one cooking right now. And maybe she's better at something else than I am. Let her be good at that. Or let's, as a team, learn or, or teach me how to cook. Hello. Let's spend some time together. See, that's one thing that bullies don't do. Bullies don't think in terms of helping others. They're only about helping themselves. And we have to be careful when we fall into that because we often fall into that. And Archie just mentioned, too, our children are watching us. They are seeing the dynamic. They're seeing mom getting cussed out by dad or dad getting a shoe thrown at him by mom and called every name under the sun. That is in, impressed into their little psyches. And because it's in them, ultimately, it's going to come out of them. But when that child acts it out outside the house, we get mad at them and say, why did you do that? We talked about it a few weeks ago, and uh, Reverend Seeger said it. Frankenstein's monster. We focus so much on the monster that we forget about Frankenstein who created him. And we need to look at what we're creating and what we've created when it acts out and that child acts up and acts out. We need to look, turn the light inwardly and realize that, hey, I have helped cause it's not that that child didn't have a decision to make for themselves because they do. But what was the example that we were given to them as being the house bullies? Talk to me. 
Well, also, there are so many other ways that you can bully someone. And, and I don't even know, it kind of, the terminology changes. It goes from bullying to being abusive. Mm-hmm. So uh, I can be uh, emotionally abusive um, and manipulative. Um, I can be um, financially abusive um, where I might... Um, withhold my funds and won't pay the bills or the bill that you like or give you your allowance or whatever. I don't know. Um, one can be, um, mentally abusive, you know, um, where you're just playing a mind game with the person. And, uh, that's definitely being uh, a bully. Absolutely. Um, and, um, so sometimes people can say that they're not bullies, but I submit that, a lot of times they are. I don't think I don't. I've got friends that wouldn't say they were bullies, but mm-hmm. if I got a chance to break down the way in which they carried themselves, they would say, "Ooh, okay, well maybe." <laughs> well, since you put it that way, it, it's hard <laughs> for I, uh, it's hard for us to accept that we we're bullies. It's easy to see somebody else being a bully, well, and what scripture and what you what you're saying also. And I said I was going to come back to that earlier as well. Uh, what women tend to use is is called rational aggression. Rational aggression is they use emotions to get the majority of the things they want. They know how to get to the man because, well, you know, see what you did. And the man, I'm like, ah, he gives in. He caters to that rather than simply say, we need to talk about this. It's not about you being right and me being wrong. We need to find out the truth. And if we're willing to find out the truth, the truth isn't about manipulation, but it's about conversation. And if I can converse with you, instead of you using emotion, and women use a lot of that, that I'm not putting them down, but the gossiping thing, and women know how to draw you away by the emotion, and we get into that. That's why I said the men will get in another man and punch him out. But the woman knows how to quietly sit on the side and get you to do what they want to do, and if you don't do it, and I want to touch on that happy wife, happy life thing, too. To manipulate the whole situation. Exactly. I'll be quiet. I won't argue with you, but you ain't getting none. Okay, now we that's open to everybody out there. You interpret that getting none, okay? Just saying. <laughs> but so, that's true. Uh, See, that's that is well, true. That's, that's manipulation. Well, that's that's part of being that impact because she knows what to say and you what to do. To push. Exactly. And she knows she can get away with that. And that's why some of these some women out here being bullies, they realize, hey, dude, if you don't do what I say, you know what? If you even look like you want to put your hands on me, I'll call the police and tell them you did. She played the mind game and she's manipulated the situation. And the guy knows if I step over that line, she can do that. And nine times out of 10, she will do that. In the book I wrote, uh, She's the Boss, I talked about the statistic. Women who will call the police on men and men calling the police on women. 99% of the time when the police show up, if the man called the police, they're going to take the man out. If the woman called the police, they're going to take, take the, the man, man out. <laughs> so, so what we're looking at, and that is, is that happy wife, happy life thing, it's a lot of malarkey. That came in 1998 by Jeff Allen. It was a comic guy who used that, but it originally came out in 1902, 1903, when a guy put in a, por- a poem about and he just one phrase in there says happy wife, happy life, happy wife. So and that's not even a biblically sound thing, but we take it and say, oh, you know what, happy wife, happy life. No, well, the biblical principle says a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Yes, I, it does. And I went and I really dug into that. Uh, what is a wife? And in the pro, uh, Proverbs thirty one. Yeah, Proverbs thirty one. Explain uh, uh, a virtuous woman is a wife. The things she does. I mean. What's a well-oiled machine? As long as it's a well-oiled machine, that means it's been taught to be a well-oiled machine. That woman who said also in that same passage, uh, Proverbs 31, it says, and a husband can safely trust in her. True. That means there's some communication going on between the two. The dynamic is that it's not a one-man show or one-woman show. They're working together unitedly to accomplish the uh, uh, same goal. Go ahead, Art. You look like you want to... Say something. Yeah, it's just one word. It's marriage. There's two individuals that are working together. Well, not one it. over on this side and one on the other side. Let's it's a marriage. It. Let's take, no, it's not a It's a covenant. You got to understand. It's a, a what? It's a covenant. A covenant relationship. Yes. It's not a marriage because a marriage, 
You can be married to anything, but I'm, I'm just saying things that I. No, you can't be married to anything. This, this Wait a minute, time. You, you guys yeah. are on a whole different <laughs> show now. We, we, that's another show we'll get to. It's another show. We're talking about <laughs> bullying <laughs> and <laughs> this thing. The bullying. We're talking about how women can manipulate, and I'm not saying that. To put anyone down, Marva's here. She can defend herself because I know she can't defend all women. Because as men, we can't say a blanket statement, all women when are we like taught, this. When we were taught. Exactly. That's what we were actually molded and shaped to be bullies. Yes, and I have to agree with that. So th with that being said, we need to help offset that. Again, that's coming back to what we were saying earlier. How do we deal with that? Because we have been taught to be bullies. Men are always taught in the house. My house, under my house, under my roof, under my roof. You're going to do what I say, blah, blah, blah. So he's pushing that, and he's even pushing that mentality on his wife. And they're not being a team at that point. Going back to what Archie was saying, too, that teamwork is not there. The bullying mentality is there. So we need to come together and iron out what we need to do to end how bullying is done. Because if it's starting at home, which is... It usually does. It's going to go out into the community, Correct. which it does. It's going to reach into the schools, which it does. Correct. And many of us who were children bullies grow up to be what? Old bullies. Until someone breaks the breaks The, the cycle. Yeah, breaks the cycle. Yes. So what we want to do and what we seek with this program is also help in that cycle. Unlocking the power of you means you can't change things you don't want to admit that is a part of you. If you never say, I'm a bully... You'll never change being a bully because you're going to do, as Marvin, you were saying, you can tell your friends, oh, you're a bully. They go, well, no, I'm not really a bully. But when you start giving the A to Z and then you get down to F and G, they realize, well, there's, maybe I am a bully then. But even with that knowledge, what are you doing with the knowledge that you now know that you were a bully or are a bully? You're making correction. You're educating that this is not the platform that you want to build. So who do we start with then? Us. Okay. That individual? Yeah, us. Us first, because it's, it's, we start with ourselves, and then we communicate to others, and then we need to be very apologetic. Oh, and that's another bad word you're using now. You're saying being apologetic. Yes. That's saying, I can admit I was wrong. That's a hard pill to swallow. When you don't want to swallow it. Come on. I said this in a, uh, a seminar once, some years ago. I asked the, the audience, I said, can anybody tell me what the hardest thing in the world to do is? And hands went up. They said, stop drinking, stop smoking, womanizing, doing all these different things. I said, none of those are wrong. But I'm going to tell you what the hardest thing in the world to do is. And I challenge any of you to come and tell me that it's not. And they waited. I said, now, here's the hardest thing in the world to do. Anything you don't want to do. Now, you think about it. If you don't want to stop being something, you're going to make excuses to continue to be that. True. It gets easy when you decide and you make up in your mind, this is what I'm going to do. I don't, I'm not going to fall for that anymore. That's not who I am. That may have been who I was, but who I am now, I'm a better person for this because someone dared to tell me the truth about me. Now, how many of us really appreciate hearing the truth about us? Not many. <laughs> Marvin, you like, oh, come on, you, you took a sigh there. Go on with it. I was trying to debate if I wanted to share this with you guys or not, but um, I know that it, it is ugly. It could be ugly, I mean, to see what you really look like. And um, I remember being really upset. Everything comes back. It seems to be coming back to me talking about my marriage. But I remember being really upset and saying, you know, God, you need to fix him. He this, mm. he this, nothing. It was wrong with him. Mike, and da, da, da. And God was just like, hey, I don't need you to worry about him. I got mm -hmm. him. I'm going to need you to fix you. And I was just like, well, hey, ain't nothing wrong with me. I ain't do nothing. But I, <laughs> I do this and this. No, 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 no. I don't do all the stuff that he's doing. Da, 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 da. He's like, mm, 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 mm. I'm going to need you to focus on you. And so I was just like, okay, well, you know what? Because um, you're, you're just being ugly right now. Oh, okay, well, show me what you see. Let me see me the way you see me, Lord. That's what I want. Show me that. It was so ugly. <laughs> it was so ugly. He showed me me the way in which he, he saw sees, me. Yes. And it was the outline of my of of a human, outline of a body, 
and it was black and it had a bunch of holes in it. Big old holes, just holes through it. I'm not gonna do nothing but cry. I was like, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna be like that. And I believe that was a great um changing turning point for me to become more empathetic, um, to be more uh, accountable for my own actions and my thoughts and things of that nature. And to just be um, just just more loving and acceptable for a lot of things that originally I wasn't. So I understand what you're saying. And, and what you said also, I wrote in another book, and it was just a thought. It says, when I change my view of things, the things I view will change. See, what we tend to do is say, if they change, if they change, the Lord said, no, no, no. If you change, mm-hmm. and, and what you said was monumental biblically, because in Isaiah 6, what the Lord said, when he said, in the year the king Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord high and lifted up. So what happened when Isaiah's God was moved, his manly God was moved, then he was able to see God. And yeah, what did God did show him? The first thing God showed him was himself. We don't want to see ourselves first. We want to see somebody else. We, we want to see what needs to be corrected by, about them. When we go to the mirror, God said, you look in the mirror to see you, not to see who's looking at you look in the mirror. So it, we need to reconcile that about ourselves. He said, simply say, look, I need to show you you. And if I can show you how messed up you are, then you can see how messed up other people are. Then when I get you cleaned up. Then I'm giving you the power to go and help somebody or get cleaned up. Now, he's giving us the power to help them get cleaned up. You can't clean them, nor can you keep them clean. But it's our responsibility to make sure they know how to get cleaned. It's our responsibility to these young people and everybody around us not to have a bully's mentality. Whether you're male or female, it's time for us to change that and come out of that. We're down to our last two minutes of the program. So... I need for everyone to share with me what you have and what you want to take away and what you want to leave with our viewing audience and our listening audience. I leave empathy. You can get empathy. You could step into the other person's shoes. It'll halt you from carrying on toward negatively towards someone once you're in their shoes. Go on, mister. Bully. Yeah. It's bullying. X, X. Uh, very interesting perspective and having it here with my friend over here uh, and Mr. Jones. Uh, certainly appreciate it. And one thing I'd like to say, uh, early on, Marva talked about Dyslexia, and she scored going after her master's in English and creative writing, 100 percentile that she's gotten and everything. So my point is that things can change in life if you get focused and look what has happened. Communication. Be a better communicator because big corporations have failed because of communication. Absolutely. Marriages have failed because of communication. Parenting has failed because of communication. So if we get a better communication established between each individual, we'll make success. And nothing out there, nothing out there can prevent you from being the best person you can be. Example, going after master degree. Why? She was a bully, an admitted bully, but she's an educator now. So you can take anything negative and turn it into a positive. No matter, and, and people say, you know what? I'm a product of my, my uh, environment. No, you shape your environment. Your environment is not shaping you. No matter where you come from, if you have the mind to do something positive, you're going to do that, that positive thing and make that positive you're going to attract positive things to us. That's what this is all about. Unlocking the power of you. Everyone has the power in them, but we need for you to learn how to unlock that power. And, and my partners put this up here again. It's like, hey, would you tell people about this book that's coming out? This book that is coming up is called Lynching. Rope No Longer Required on the Market this month coming up in May. And we'll be talking about that again later. Those of you, those of you who need to uh, get with us, you can get with us. We're excited about this program and what the direction is taking and all of you here. Of course, you guys don't mind coming back. We asked that on the air. So if you say, yeah, we invite you back. It's normal every time we got it recorded. So if you guys like to come back sometime in the very yes, near future. sounds great. Okay. We appreciate you guys being here. Exciting program about bullying. It's our turn to make a difference. You guys see you next week. <laughs>